Hi guys, so this is part one of the reptile notes that I'm going to walk you through. There's 25 slides. I'm going to try to go through as quick as I can, but um, kind of break everything down for you. So make sure that you are taking your own notes. Um, at this point in the semester, you kind of see what we focus on um, in each class of animals. Um, so you kind of know like what to like follow um, throughout each class. So let's start talking about some reptiles. So um, there's a huge difference between amphibians and reptiles. And one of the big evolutionary changes that we're going to see is all about the egg that they use to reproduce. Um, amphibians always had to have contact with water because um, their eggs had a membrane on the outside that allowed um, oxygen to pass through from the water. So amphibians were really reliant on water for um, that external development and external fertilization. So we're going to see some changes in that now. Um, so because of those eggs having that permeable membrane, they had to live in that moist environment. But we're going to start seeing um, a membrane that an additional membrane that develops on the outside of the egg. And so we are going to see the evolutionary change of um, a, an amniotic an amniotic egg um, forming. And this is going to be prevalent in reptiles, birds, and even some mammals. So this is not um, a, an egg type that can be found in fish or amphibians. And we'll see that we start to have lots of different layers and parts involved with these eggs. Um, so on the very outside edges, the outside layers of the egg, we are going to have um, the chorion, which is the out, outermost edge of the egg, so that outside membrane, and it's going to be involved in gas exchange, so this is how the embryo is able to get oxygen. We will also see um, an allantois, which has to do with collecting waste products, and um, as well as gas exchange as well. So the exchange of waste gas, so like carbon dioxide. Um, we'll see the amnion, which is involved with protecting the embryo. So it's like a nice little layer around it. <clears throat> um, we have the yolk sac, which um, in previous um, notes we have talked about it being the source of nutrition for the embryo um so you know baby's got to grow baby's got to get nutrition somehow so that's where the yolk comes from and if you think about a chicken egg that's um, the yolk of a chicken egg that's where the baby chicks get their nutrition from we will also see the embryo inside of these eggs and then there is a small cavity between the amnion and the embryo and that is where amniotic fluid is found so lots of different pieces and parts, and I will tell you, you need to know what the different um, layers and structures inside an amniotic egg are responsible for, like what their function is. Um, and this is just kind of laying those out for you guys as well. Let me see if I can, can I move myself? Uh, there we go. So um, sorry, still learning some new programs and things for you guys. Um, so you can see, um, some different layers here, try to give you a little bit better of an idea. Um, when we're going to be talking about the reptiles, though, they're going to have what we call a leathery shell. Um, it is not going to be hard like a chicken egg. It is um, soft. It is, it, it is an, a, a thick membrane on the outside of the eggs, but they are um, soft. Like if I wanted to push on them, they would indent. Um, normally in school, I have some dried, um, empty uh, snake eggs from uh, Professor Argent that I would pass around to show you guys. So you could see how they, um, as they dry out, they kind of, um, they harden up because of that lack of moisture. But this also allows um, th things, especially like snakes, um, when they lay their masses of eggs, they call, they're called a clutch when you have like a whole bunch of eggs together and they kind of sort of stick together in a mound and that happens because these eggs are um, soft and able to be, you know, attached to one another. So this is just giving you some definitions here and clearing, clear, clarifying the, um, 
uh, layers, the extra embryonic membranes and things for you guys. Okay, so let's look at some anatomy here that we're going to see some changes. Um, remember, fish had absolutely no cervical vertebrae, so they weren't able to like just independently move their head up, down, side to side. And then in the frogs, they had one set of that cervical uh, vertebrae, so they were able to nod their head up and down. So kind of like in a saying yes motion. Reptiles, however, we are going to see some changes where they are gonna have uh, several different cervical vertebrae. So they are able to move their head up and down as well as left to right. And I guess that's one thing that creeps me out with things like snakes is that they're able to like turn their head back and look at you. <laughs> um, it's a little, a little creepy to me. So that is one um, anatomical evolutionary change that we're gonna be looking at is that the uh, um, reptiles now have more cervical vertebrae, so they have more free movement of their head in comparison to the amphibians and the fish. Um, just giving you some bone structure um, to look at here, we can see that the vertebrae through time here is getting more and more complex as well as the bone structure. Skull anatomy is going to be a little bit different here as well. Um, we are going to see a couple of different um, changes and structures to skulls. You could have a structure that is called an anapsid, which means they have absolutely no openings in the temporal region. So do you guys know where your temples are? I'll pull my video back up. Your temples are here on the sides of your heads. Um, so in anapsids, they actually don't have any openings there on the sides of their heads. Um, synapsids will, will have one opening um, in their temporal re region, and it's used for the attachment of their jaw muscles here. Um, so we're going to see a hole in the skulls here, and it's used for the attachment of the upper and lower jaw muscles. And then you'll have a diapsid, di meaning two. Um, most living reptiles and the birds will have two openings here. And I'll show you some images. Okay, so we have an anapsid. Okay, so here is the eye opening. So watch, so this is the anapsid. So this is no openings. Okay, so we have the nostril, we have the eye. This would be the temporal region here. And notice no openings. A synapsid, okay, a synapsid is one. So we have the eye, here is your temporal opening, and we have one opening there. The diapsid, meaning two openings, and in our temporal region, we see two openings in the skull. So you might even want to pause and make like a little sketch to help you out with that vocab um, because it can be a little bit tricky. So um, just like things that we talked about that have asymmetry, that asymmetry means no symmetry. So anapsid with the A means no opening in the skull. Synapsid, single. Um, diapsid, di means two. So um, I would maybe pause and give a quick little sketch so you remember where the temporal region is and the number of openings that are going to be found in the different types of skulls in that temporal region. Um, just some live skulls um, or real skulls so you can kind of see the different openings here in the temporal regions. Same with humans. Single opening here. Okay. Okay, so um, we're going to be moving into birds. Um, birds are reptiles, but the biggest, one of the biggest changes is that they're going to have wings. Um, they also have a single um, occipital condyle, which is that, that um, connection um, in their um, skulls. Um, they're going to have an inner ear, a stapes. They are going to have a lower jaw and they have a secondary palate uh, or they lack a secondary palate. Um, for us, if you, the palate's the roof of your mouth, 
if you touch the your tongue to the roof of your mouth like um, just above like right above your tongue if you touch your tongue there to the roof of your mouth you'll notice that it's it's fairly hard but if you move your tongue back in your throat you'll feel where it kind of stops being hard and gets softer because you have in mammals we have a hard palate and then we have a soft palate further back in the throat Um, and there's going to be a lot of genetic and molecular similarities between birds and reptiles. So that's just kind of preliminary to show you what's going on with that. So let's start talking about reptile characteristics um, and give a little bit of an overview here. So they are going to be well adapted to start living on land. So um, a big evolutionary shift is going to be less of a reliance on water in order to survive. Fish relied on water in order to get oxygen. The amphibians relied on water because of their reproduction and as well as um, getting oxygen because of that moist skin. But um, some of the evolutionary changes that we see is that we're going to have an amniotic egg, so it's able to hold in that moisture for that developing embryo, so we no longer need water for reproduction. They're um, going, these reptiles are going to have scales that allow their skin to be watertight, so they don't have to worry about drying out, whereas the amphibian, you know, they relied on water in order to stay moist as well as gas exchange. Um, we are going to see one occipital condyle, which is where the um, skull attaches to the vertebrae. Okay, so this is in the back of the head. So we're, um, and they say occipital because the very back of your head is the um, occipital lobe. So where it attaches at the back, it's an occipital condyle. Condyle just like means connection point. Okay, so we're going to see one. Um, attachment point for the skull to the vertebrae. Um, we are also going to see a change in the kidneys where they are going to start conserving water, whereas we looked at um, freshwater fish and because of all of that extra water that they had in comparison to the ions in their body, they would urinate constantly, whereas now we're going to see kidneys that conserve water um, so that we're not constantly having to drink. So that's what we're going to see with the reptiles. We're also going to see a three-chambered heart with the uh, reptiles, except crocodiles, which are the most um, advanced type of reptile, they're actually going to have four uh, chambers in their hearts, which makes them more closely related to a mammal because we also have four chambers in our hearts. But because of a lot of other characteristics that crocodiles ex um, display, they are considered reptiles. We are going to have claws. Well, remember the frogs didn't actually have any claws. They just had pads on their um, phalanges, their fingers. Um, so this is going to help them with digging as well as movement. They're going to have an improved respiratory system. So we're going to talk about their lungs. They no longer have a lateral line like the fish or the amphibians to detect um, the vibration and sound waves and things like that. Um, and there's going to be 17 orders of reptiles, but only about four um, orders are still alive today. Um, so lots of fossil history here. Ooh. Okay, so let's talk about these watertight scales. So what happens here is um, each of these, let me see, let me get you some color here. So each one of these is an individual scale and they are kind of over, as you can see, they're overlapped over one another and this allows them to kind of lock together like plates. And um, let's see, let me erase some things here. Here, It allows the scales to move up and down a little bit. Um, this helps allow for growth or if the um, organism is, some of them have a defense mode where they, you know, animals will try to make themselves appear larger where they can lift their scales a little bit in order to um, appear larger than they are. But they have these overlapping scales um, that lie flat and are basically watertight. So it is like this animal being wrapped in saran wrap. Um, it really helps hold in its uh, moisture very, very efficiently. 
um, in this way. And when you think of scales, don't necessarily think hard um, like the uh, fish scales. There is a difference in scales depending on what part of the body you're touching on a reptile, in particular like a snake. Um, some parts of the body are tightly interlocked where others are not. Um, some of them are feel very rough and hard. Some of them are very smooth and almost soft feeling. So um, this is an adaptation in the type of scales that a reptile is going to have is also going to depend on um, what type of environment and predators and things these animals have to worry about. So this is just showing you that we have this over tight overlapping of scales to help um, with um, keeping in as much water as possible um, in the bodies of a reptile. <clears throat> um, and these reptiles, they will molt. So this is what you're seeing over here with this uh, lizard here, um, as well as this snake. As they grow, their scales don't grow with them. So those uh, flexible hinges will lift as the organism is growing. And um, as you move just like us, um, skin gets further and further away from the body. It can dry out. It can't, you know, we don't provide nutrients to it as much. Um, and as the scales lift, we get molting or shedding of the outermost layer of scales. And that is to help allow the organism to um, grow. And it is important to note that their skin, unlike the amphibians, absolutely no respiration goes through their skin. So they are not worried about maintaining moisture. They are not um, getting any oxygen through their skin. This is just a protective barrier from the outside elements. So again, that skin, uh, those scales are to help prevent water loss, seals them in, um, and provide protection from um, both predators and um, the environment. So they will often shed or molt the outside layer of their scales in order to grow. And this is also called ecdysis. So ecdysis, shedding, molting, kind of the same idea, um, just different terminology there. Okay, looking at the uh, skeletons here. Um, we're going to have skulls that are more elongated than the amphibians. If you remember, the amphibians kind of had a flattened, wide skull. Um, these guys um, with the reptiles are going to be a little more elongated. Um, and they have um, a secondary palate. So um, much like ours, they're going to have that hard plate directly above their tongue, just like ours. And if you move further back, we have that soft palate, and that actually partially uh, helps to separate the nasal cavity from the mouth. Um, they're going to have those cervical vertebrae. That is the, um, I remember talking to you guys about this neck surgery I had. Your cervical vertebrae is in through your neck, and we're going to have an atlas and an axis, and that is the bones that connect your skull to your vertebrae. Okay, so that's your C1 and C2, cervical uh, vertebrae number one and number two. Um, it, the surgery I had, I had from C2 all the way to C7 worked on. So basically like right at the base of my skull, people were poking around. Um, but by having those um, bones there, they allow for more movement. So these organisms are able to move their head right to left and up and down. So they definitely have a lot more free movement there. Um, their limbs are going to allow them to, are, are a little more outward instead of directly underneath of them. Um, like uh, if you think about a dog or a cat, uh, their front and rear uh, limbs are directly underneath of them, whereas in the uh, reptiles are a little more off to the side. So that's what it means by their limbs extend laterally. Their limbs are more off to the side, whereas mammals, it's more directly underneath of ours. Um, some primitive reptiles were bipedal, meaning they only walked on two legs.
Um, we see this sometimes. Um, there are, I think, a couple of commercials I think I saw for maybe like Geico where geckos will actually get up on their back two legs and like scamper and run a little bit. So um, it still occurs today, but mostly ancestral ones. All right, so let's look at nutrition and digestion. We've got a nice uh, couple of chameleons here. So they are going to have different feeding habits and different mechanisms and capabilities for feeding, depending on what they eat. Um, some reptiles are herbivores and only eat um, plants. Some are carnivores and strictly only eat other uh, animals, and some kind of eat both. Um, turtles don't have any teeth whatsoever. Um, if you look at the front of a turtle, it more or less looks like a beak, and that beak is extremely hard, almost like bone. It's this really hard keratin, um, so that is how they are able to um, feed is by basically just using the front part of their mouth. They don't actually have teeth, and if we remember, we watched um, sea turtles. They like to eat, um, one of the animals that they do eat is sea sponges. Um, sea turtles will actually eat uh, Portuguese man-o-war, which is one of the uh, most um, painful and toxic jellyfish. Um, or It's not really a jellyfish, it's an adarian, but it's related to a jellyfish. Um, they'll eat those and don't seem to be affected by it whatsoever, and that's because of their really tough, really thick skin and that um, hardened beak in front of them. <clears throat> Some lizards have sticky, movable tongues. It would remind you of an amphibian, um, but they actually secrete um, a mucus on their tongues that make it very sticky um, as well. So there, we're going to see lots of different feeding habits when we start talking about the different um, groups of reptiles. We'll talk about their feeding habits as well. So um, let's look at their circulation because this was something that we've been following throughout. And if you remember in the amphibians, we had a single loop system and they only had the um, three chambered heart, the two atrium and one ventricle. Okay, so with these guys, we are going to see reptiles um, are much larger in size than the amphibians, so it is going to require that blood to move a lot further away from the body. So you're going to see an increase in uh, blood pressure, and that is the pressure from the um, blood on the walls of the vessels. Um, I, I guess the way that I explain it is if you guys have ever um, use the garden hose. You turn the water on and the water comes out of the hose. Well, if you put your thumb over the end of the hose, the water sprays out much more with, with more pressure behind it. That's because by blocking part of the water, you've increased the pressure on, of the water on the hose. So it moves much more fast when it gets out of the hose. Same idea here with um, the circulation we are going to increase the pressure so that it moves farther um, because the body of a reptile is much larger than the body of an amphibian. Um, so imagine like in these uh, ancestral reptiles like a brachiosaurus, it had to move blood from the heart all the way to its head, which is about six meters, which is about 18 feet uh, roughly. And that, that's pretty far. Um, amphibians could not have done that because their, their circulatory system was just not set up in order to do that. Um, so most reptiles, again, are going to have a three-chambered heart, which is two atrium and one ventricle. Now, what makes this different than the amphibian is that the um, ventricle is going to be partially separated. So in mammals, we're gonna have a four-chambered heart, two atrium, two ventricle, and the ventricle is separated by a membrane. And that membrane is right here, okay? So this is your ventricle on the bottom here, and then we have the left and right atrium. Oh, crud, can't go back. Um, that's okay, this'll work. 
this picture is fine. So um, here in the reptiles, well, let's look at the amphibians here. Notice that in the ventricle, it's just one, one ventricle, there's no membrane in between it. Whereas here in the reptile, you notice that there is a, uh, a structure starting to form here. And that is a septum. A septum just means something that separates two things. Um, when people pierce their septum, that is the structure that is between their two nostril openings. So that's what a septum is. Um, so as we move forward into birds and mammals, a change that we're going to see is that that ventricle is completely and totally separated into two separate ventricles. Um, and this allows um, no mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Um, it's much more confined and more um, uh, efficient is the word I was looking for there, choking on my own words. Okay, so with having only this partially separated um, heart, the uh, partially septum ventricle, you're going to have some mixture of the oxygen rich blood from the lungs and the deoxygenated blood from the rest of the body. So that's what you get with the uh, crisscross lines here. So um, it's getting more efficient, but we are going to see it eventually get the most efficient circulatory system and heart um, once we read birds and mammals. Okay, so it's an incomplete separation of blood flow. So we do have some mixture um, between the pulmonary and systemic circuits of the from the blood um, circulating in the body and the blood that circulates um, from the heart, those two those pathways will intermix. Um, but there's an advantage to this because there is basically some oxygen always somewhere in their blood um, because of that partial mixture there. Um, reptiles don't have to breathe as often as like we do, like a mammal does. So they can kind of intermittently breathe. So they can actually hold still without having to take a breath for a while because there's still a good amount of oxygen in their blood. Um, unfortunately, there is less purely oxygenated, oxygen-rich blood because there's still some of the mixing going on. So some of their blood is, all, part of their blood is always at a disadvantage as well um, because it's partially um, deoxygenated all the time because of that partially separated ventricle. Crocodiles are going to be our one exception because they have evolved to have a four chambered heart. So that ventricle is going to be truly separated into a right and left ventricle. Um, so, okay. Um, this is just showing you some different st structural um, options in reptiles, whereas the lizard, um, the right uh, ventricle is a little bit smaller than the left side. So it, it's starting that septum right here is not perfectly centered it's just off to the side and the opposite is in the snake whereas the uh, left ventricle is significantly smaller than the right it's offset the um, crocodile here we see has a perfect uh, split down the middle just about um, and then when we see the turtle the turtle actually has a, a slightly larger heart than the rest and the left ventricle is also going to be much, much larger. Um, but you can see how some of these structures are in different places, whereas the left and a right atrium are, are on either side of the aorta here in the crocodile. Um, but they are maintained being on the same side in the others. So there's just variations in just a single structure, which is um, interesting to see. Um, so yeah so let, let's kind of wrap up what you need to know about the circulatory system there so um, reptiles have a three-chambered heart two atrium one ventricle and they have an incomplete septum in the ventricle 
So it's still considered one ventricle, even though it's um, reptiles are kind of the in-between. They haven't quite fully separated it into two separate ventricles yet, with one exception. The exception is the crocodiles. They do have a four-chambered heart because they have a complete separation of a left and right ventricle in addition to two, the right and left atrium. Okay, so that's kind of to wrap that up a little bit here. You guys are hanging in there. Great, we've only got five more slides. So um, these guys use negative pressure in order to breathe. So um, that mean, meaning that they have to actually inhale and exhale, which is different than the amphibians because um, the amphibians relied on diffusion of oxygen through their skin. Now, reptiles do not have a diaphragm. A diaphragm is a thin membrane, like in humans, um, that separates your thoracic cavity, which is all the organs that are inside of your uh, rib cage, your heart, your lungs, from your abdomen, which is where your, you know, your digestive system is. There's a thin muscle membrane that runs um, just under your rib cage, separating those two cavities. And when it gets a muscle spasm, that's what causes the hiccups. It's because that membrane spasms, hits your lungs, and causes you to gasp for air. Um, reptiles do not have that diagram, but they pull in air by increasing the size of their body cavity. So they actually, um, when they breathe in, they um, I'll have to put give you a video link so you can see how their bodies um, move in order to pull in that air. Um, it, it's similar to ours, but without that diaphragm, their entire um, body cavity uh, enlarges. So kind of like with us, if you um, feel us inhale, our thoracic cavity gets a little bit larger. It's because our lungs are filling with air. Same idea with the reptiles, their body will, their entire ab, uh, body cavity increases in size. Problem with that, turtles unfortunately can't um, get as deep of a breath that way because their ribs won't expand outward a little bit. Like if you feel us when we breathe in, if you put your hands on your ribs, pop up a video here, if you put your hands on your ribs, you'll feel your ribs move just a little bit. Well, turtles can't do that because their skeletal system is attached to their shell. You cannot remove a turtle from its shell. You would actually rip its spine out because its spine is part of that carapace, the shell of a turtle, and then its ribs are also attached. Um, so it doesn't have any of that free movement. It's much more rigid. So they actually are able to push their organs down in order to inhale more. So the uh, viscera is just meaning their all of their bodily organs get pushed by their lungs when they inhale and exhale. Um, their lungs um, don't have alveoli, which we'll talk about in just a second, but have a bunch of folds in them. So by having a bunch of folds inside their lungs, that increases surface area. Um, there's more area for oxygen to attach to inside of the lungs. Um, just to give you a demonstration here. Let me show you a little piece of paper. Okay, so I just got a big old post-it note here. A lot of this post-it note is exposed to the environment right now because it's really large and flat, okay? Um, by increasing the folds, Okay, so like if this were the inside of a lung, I got a cylinder here I made out of it, okay, only this part would be able to touch the oxygen as it comes into the lungs to absorb it. All right, that's not too bad, but what if I added some folds to it? I'm accordioning, accord, making an accordion fold on this post-it, okay? So what if I did this? Ooh, not so good with folding paper. By doing that, and now I kind of have like a star shape to it, 
you guys can see, um, there's a lot more surface area here by creating, and there'd be tons and tons of folds. This is just a very simple idea, but it increases the amount of surface that is exposed to that oxygen when it's inhaled into the lungs um, in order to uh, get as much oxygen as possible. Now, in mammals specifically, I'm going to refer to humans, we have what they call alveoli. Um, in the full in the lining of our lungs and the we have different branches of our lungs we have basically little air sacs that are able to capture and hold on to oxygen um, in a way so that we almost always have like a reserve and that reserve um, gets exchanged out but um, doesn't allow for maximum capacity in our lungs. This is why we always have to breathe, is to keep a constant flow of oxygen going, um, even with that alveoli. And we'll see um, what that has to do with um, organisms that can hold their breath underwater longer. Um, reptiles, they are cold-blooded, so they are only able to get their, um, maintain their body temperature depending on where they live. So um, their environment is going to determine their um, body temperature. So um, they are subject to extreme weather changes because they're terrestrial, not so much in the water. It takes a lot more um, energy or temperature changes to make water get warmer or colder. This is why in the winter time, it has to be cold for a really long time in order for a lake to freeze over um, or even for snow to stick to the ground because it's got to take, it takes a while for the ground to um, cool off. And a lot of times um, reptiles will burrow in order to maintain body temperature in colder temperatures. Um, so they have to regulate their body temperature by some behavior that they might do because they are ectotherms, meaning they get their body temperature maintained by the environment around them. The outside environment is what determines their body temperature. So ecto meaning outside. Um, they will hibernate if they, um, if it gets too cold, they actually go into something called torpor, which is they start moving a lot slower. Their metabolism for um, breaking down food into usable energy slows down so that they don't have to eat right away. Same idea with like grizzly bears. Um, they sleep. They just hang out. Their metabolism moves slower so they don't have to deplete their energy supply. Um and sometimes they will even like huddle up. Um, you guys would think this is a rattlesnake nest. It's actually a, a hibernaculum, which just means a pile of snakes that are hibernating all together and using each other's body heat to stay warm. Um, this would probably be a very terrifying thing to come upon if you are out walking around, um, but they are gonna move a little bit slower. It doesn't mean that they're any less dangerous. Um, but this is how they survive. They, they cuddle. <laughs> They're cuddling to survive. Okay. Um, this is really cool. Okay. Their nervous systems and sensory functions. I really wish, you know, we didn't have to deal with this uh, quarantine because I was going to have Professor Argent come in and really show you and go get into some of these uh, nervous and sensory functions with some of his uh, limbless critters that he would have brought in. But We'll do our best with what we've got. Okay, so they are going to have a binocular um, vision. So um, with the uh, amphibians, remember their eyes were kind of on the sides of their heads a little bit. So um, this eye would only perceive what was it was capable of seeing here and same with this. They didn't combine vision, whereas um, our eyes are more front facing. So our eyes are... Um, combine like the actual image to give us one solid vision um, image in our yeah, had, ah, I swear I'm gonna get better at explaining this so because we have two eyes they act as one they um, have we have our um, 
peripheral vision here and our um, perception of what we're seeing is in combination of the two eyes. Whereas the amphibians, they can only see, you know, what was over here with this eye, not what was going on over here because that eye was on the other side of its body. Okay, so we have, we see everything in front of us and, you know, we have that peripheral. Um, this allows us to have better depth perception. And this is how um, some of these critters are able to be much more dangerous when they are stalking prey. Um, some of them have a parietal or pineal eye that helps with light collection to allow their eyesight to be a little more um, a little more uh, accurate, but it also helps regulate um, what they, they're calling it biorhythms but it helps with like your circadian rhythm. A circadian rhythm is like we're diurnal or organisms. We're awake during the day and sleep at night, whereas nocturnal, you know, awake at night, sleep during the day. It helps regulate some of their, um, those rhythms so that they, because it collects light, you know, when is it time to do this or do that? So it helps regulate some of that. Okay. Um, they also are going to have a tympanic membrane. So just like the frogs, they have that rounded um, eardrum structure. Um, snakes are not going to have an inner ear like we do or um, the amphibians did with the couple of bones that will move. But they actually feel vibrations with their lower jaw. So a lot of times that's why you see snakes just chilling out, laying their head on the ground because that's how they can detect whether there's a food source around or not because of those vibrations. Um, they also have some pouches in the roof of their mouth. This is called Jacobson's organs. Um, move my self out of your way here so you can kind of see these pouches and they're called blind pouches which means that they don't have like a they don't open on the other end and go somewhere else it's just a little pouch um this is how they're able to smell they flick their tongue and the tongue picks up um molecules for um smell and Jacobson's organs is what um, allows them to determine what that smell is. So this is why um, snakes flick their tongue. One of their strongest sense, um, senses is for smell. Okay, as far as excretion goes, two more slides, guys, almost done. They have a metanephric uh, kidney, which um, basically just helps um, conserve water um, better than amphibians. So we've just gotten more efficient with uh, conser conserving water. They uh, produce uric acid, which is a very uh, strong um, excretion for all of the waste products. So instead of it being very liquidy, it's almost like a paste. Um, so oftentimes you would just think it was probably solid waste, but it actually is um, them excreting uh, insoluble waste products. So that's why it's not a liquid and it's more of like a thick paste that they excrete and it's got a very strong smell. Um, it's not toxic and um, the embryos inside of the eggs will actually produce it in um, thankfully it's not toxic because then it can just be collected in the egg and once the egg hatches it's you know disappears goes away we don't use you know it doesn't use used for anything um, marine reptiles there are you know like sea snakes and things like that they have salt glands in their eyes that help them get rid of excess salt um, one of the some of the organisms that um, some of the fish that we had talked about uh, also have salt glands, um, but that's typically a, a reptile thing is that they have them in their eyes and around their nose. Um, okay, this is where stuff gets kind of weird. 
reproduction, again, they're going to use that amniotic egg so they can lay eggs on land and not be dependent on water. Reptiles are dioecious. Dioecious meaning that there are two sexes. There are males and then there are females. Okay. Um, they are going to be internal fertilizers with copulation. So they are going to um, reproduce through intercourse. Um, so shouldn't be anything new um, to think about there. Um, in some female species, when they uh, copulate, they can actually create a pouch around the sperm and store it inside of their um, <laughs> reproductive cavity for years until they're like, yeah, I want to have babies. And they'll secrete an enzyme that breaks down the pouch and releases the sperm to be able to go fertilize the egg. So that is just crazy pants to me. Um, so they can almost have like their own sperm bank that they're just carrying around for years and years. Um, some lizards and snakes are parthenogenic. Parthenogenesis is um, very interesting, okay? So it means that females can reproduce on their own without um, a male, like at all. So um, just checking here. So if, gotta make sure I get this right. Um, but when they reproduce, they almost only produce um, males. And I'm going to put up a video link about this for you guys um, to help you out. And I think it's with um, Komodo dragons, maybe, or Gila monsters. I got to remember. Right. Um, but this is a desert whiptail lizard and they are all females as well um there is some you know downsides to actually parth parthenogenesis in a way as well so i'm going to set up some videos on your uh lesson page and i want you guys to check those out so you can get a little more acquainted with that Okay, um, mating, there's usually courtship involved of some kind. Um, it might be building a nest. It might be fighting off a predator. It might be creating a, a sound. Um, crocodiles are insane with the um, rituals that they have there. Um, I will definitely be putting those up. Um, females can make some pretty elaborate nests. Um, as you see here, this ball python is curled up around her eggs, her clutch, because she is keeping them warm and guarding them as well because other snakes will eat the eggs. Other, you know, crocodiles and alligators love to eat the eggs as well. Um, you know, humans suck. Humans will try to steal eggs too in order to, you know, have pets and things like that. So she's guarding them and there is nothing um, meaner than a snake that you're trying to pull away from a clutch. <laughs> they can be pretty gnarly. So I'm going to put up some video links with um, this recording so you guys can uh, check out the description box below because I'll put this on YouTube. Um, so yeah, definitely watch watch some of these because this is going to be bad. Um, and then there's going to be reptile notes part two for you guys for this week. All right, so take care. Miss you all.